professor in the Arnold A. Saltzman Institute of War and Peace Studies at Columbia University and a political consultant. Dr. Mitchell is the author of Democracy, U.S. Foreign Policy, Georgia's Rose Revolution, The Color Revolutions, and The Democracy Paradox, as well as two books about baseball. Uh, Linderman, uh, to his left, is a research fellow with Patu Center at the Atlantic Council. Her research focuses on Georgian politics, economics, foreign relations. Previously, she served as Eurasia Center Associate Director, where she developed and shaped analytic and intellectual work on Georgia, support on Turkey, Ukraine, Moldova, Armenia, and Azerbaijan, um, and the region. Uh, before we started with the uh, with the presentation, uh, I will first answer a question. Maybe some of you have: What is your Atlantic nationality? On the on the title of the event, and um, I'm going to play a central role in this discussion. I would I would answer that question saying your conditionality describes a process. Partner states take liberal democratic forms in which economic, political, or security incentives provide your Atlantic community. But these incentives are institutional or transactional, durable or symbolic, or combination. Of these, uh, but in general, you can condition really imply opportunities ever closer integration with your Atlantic structures like NATO uh, or the European Union. Uh, so, with further ado, uh, I would like to uh, pass the mic to Lincoln and uh, Lincoln. Sure. Thank you. Thank you to the foundation. Uh, important. Questions and important questions, in my view, is they ask us to ask, sitting in a capital in Tbilisi, Kiev, or Chisinau, but also in, in Washington or elsewhere, you know, elsewhere in the West Capital, you may be in a provincial town like a small, like. Um, the first question they ask us to ask why we value democracy. If, as Michael has posited, the nationality is not really there anymore, then everyone has to say, why do we? You want my country to be democratic if you're sitting in the Why do you want my country to be democratic, frankly, if you're sitting in states? But also, why do I, sitting in London or Washington or wherever, care about what happens there? It's not the conditionality. The conditionality is not just you do this, you become more democratic, we do things. It's you become an ally. Right? So it's the standalone issue. That is, we have to wrestle the meaning of democracy. Right? We no longer say that. West, and you kind of have market, uh, you know, a market economy. And there's no, you know, you kind of everyone speaks English, and you know, all of that. And we have to come up with a more robust and I think full definition of democracy. Um, and uh, you know, I actually was very impressed that my the introduction, because the way he did it is usually what happens is that you frame this by what's happening with it and and, uh, Trump and all of that. But I'm glad that you because these questions exist way were important way before all this happened. The, the rollback in the West makes it harder to answer questions. But these questions don't emerge out of right they they pre that by quite a bit. Um and, and then I want to just I, I want to suggest we should incentives is the word here, not conditionality. Because incentives means that we can offer something. Listen in in notion is that is that no one we can offer that anymore. But conditionality is a little different because we can't pull anything back, right? We, we, if you look at relations with Georgia, uh, meaning whatever country you want, we have much more carrot and very little stick. The notion that we're going to cut assistance, not plausible, right? The notion that you know, you're not going to care anymore what happens in your country is not plausible. Maybe some of the leaders want, but it's not plausible. Right? Uh, at the end of the day, or nothing. Let me rephrase that. If you peel away the layers of policy rationalizations for the United States, an ally is somebody who will take our money, right? So the reason we can never threaten that we're going to cut assistance is because actually we lose an ally. We define an ally as will you take our money, and most people are, are in life as in politics and geopolitics are happy to take your money. Um, so. What then has happened, right? How have countries, what's happened on the ground? How has this changed? 
One thing is that um, as the on the one hand, the card is is no longer there, right? Congress has seen that what we do we're not that map. The the road seems to be starting onto what rather than than, than ending. Um, and at the same time, many foreign governments to, about which we're talking today have become very good at gaming the West. They've begun to understand our real motivations. Um, they understand the winking that come accompanies talks of democracy. Well, it's okay if you're not so democratic. You to say the right thing on Russia, right? Or you got to do the right thing on a battery of security issues. Right, so, the, so, so that one kind of gets that. Um, I would say that until very recently, being strongly anti-Russia in your rhetoric was a stand for democracy, right, region. That was a surrogate measure and an imprecise and imperfect surrogate measure of democracy. I'm not sure the extent to which it changed uh, in the last 13 months or the extent it will continue to change, but that certainly was the case, and that made it easy for foreign countries to fudge their democracy. Um, I think what I've said about our limited conditionality because we can't take away assistance is not new. If I were to go to Kiev and well, if many countries and say that, they understand that. They understand that we have tools in our toolbox and we like that we have and that gives, uh, weakens, weakens the West. Um, so i just talk a little bit about, about how, how then, given all that, how do we build momentum? How do we create the energy needed to consolidate democracy, to solidify, to move countries? Um, first thing I think is that it is more important than ever to believe in these ideas, to really understand them. And that sounds like it doesn't mean anything. But I, I think it actually means something. For a long time, this is the moment our Berlin democracy, obviously, I'm leaving, leaving domestic American Democrat back in some moment. But you can't say to a Cree, if you do this, we will do that. When the second half of that sense becomes plausible. And as certainly, off the record, how it is viewed in many, many cases. Now, we know that the map is coming, right? With NATO may happen, but for a while, right? Certainly with the EU, any kind of Euro uh, organization. Um, so, our efforts to sell or to promote democracy can no longer be based upon that transactional. It has to be based upon the ideals. But it also has a domestic component to that. Uh, domestic, that if you are sitting in Georgia, pick one country at random, um, for a long time, democracy was key to national security strategy in Georgia. I first wrote that in thousand. Seven, eight people thought that was not, you know, people, um, well, actually people didn't agree because they thought Georgia was already democratic. Um, but that was considered new. Now that's considered an old idea. It's less true now because, in fact, regardless of what's happened in Georgian democracy, the national security, kind of, the, more democracy didn't get them into NATO, less democracy didn't alienate the West, so it's a con not a variable. Uh, but for methods of internal stability, democracy is probably important. If you believe in democracy, Believe in democracy, and where you believe it's the government domestic instability when there's domestic stability, when there's war, when there's peace, when there's everything in between, and that's my view. So, for for many of these countries, the the the, the way to re-energize this is because the domestic stability may be at stake. More democracy, not less, may be the way. To Range of radical problems, and I would say, if we look at Ukraine, which is you know, kind of the most difficult, challenging country in the region, and certainly the biggest in, in many regards, given the last events, last few years, there are many interpretations of what happened in you know 2012 to 14, and what what caused that to happen. But certainly, one of them would be democracy wasn't strong enough, right? More democracy, stronger institutions in Ukraine might have led to more stability and prevented um, the need to have the Euromaidan movement. Might have made it. Uh, the last couple points I make here is that our record in all of this region is complex. We talk about quality or not. We have many successes and many failures. We've made, we've delivered on many promises we've enabled. And here I'm speaking both the U.S. but collectively as well. 
We've been able to deliver on others. You know, the last year, uh, there was a spate, or last, I guess, 18 months ago, there have been a spate of 25 years celebrations of this event, event, the end of the beginning of that. This is now a long time. We're not, this is not three days anymore in the grand of, you know, Earth's history. But in, in this, the the uh, I don't know, the country, our, Azerbaijan has existed for an Indian state more than about thirty percent of the world. yeah. So we're pretty far down. These relationships are very uh, complicated, and uh, we need to by thinking about that and saying that just promise and be surprised when they don't deliver or be surprised. people that we haven't delivered for twenty years on some. I know we have on us, and that's the context in which it occurs. And then, you know, and I think, again, there are countries in the region clearly in flux, right? Ukraine remain in a country where the regime is in, is in flux. It's not clear to me where it goes uh, for 20, 36 months. And it's clear to me that this, this real level of stability that's really sustainable. Uh, there are other countries in the region where, in my opinion, it's not. Uh, it's not always the, the one that everyone seems to agree, but I'll um, say it anyway. Where where change has slowed, and but the illusion of change has not always slowed. So what we're seeing is some countries settling into kind of a semi democracy. Uh, it's pretty hard to to, to get. The other countries all into a authoritarian, which is not last forever, but will likely be, repla be replaced another semi authoritarian regime, right? And this is, in fact, the history of modern in many respects, the much of the world modern times. And, and because of that, it's very difficult to, to, to think about not just what you have, kind of a plausible conditionality, but what do you do even with it? Because we have a plausible condition that didn't uh, work. Uh, so, so I'm going to maybe end there and make more comments when there are no questions. Okay, thank you, Lincoln. That was thought-provoking. Next, we have Laura Linderman. Uh, Laura, floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks for the remarks. It's very interesting how you framed the question, which in sort of a, a different direction. I, I was, when I sort of saw the question um, and talked about this, thinking, well, given the reality of what we know, for example, the next partnership summit, 2019, they're not, there's going to not be credible EU membership. For the you know Eastern countries, let's say it, um, the, any reform agenda being undertaken, sort of in countries, you know Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, it's done in an environment that's not benign. Information aggression, a lot of stuff happening. So given the situation as it is right now, this que these questions of conditionality are really interesting. And it's, um, what and what sort of approach can uh, what do we see? What sort of carrots are going to be possible to offer or not? Um, I, and I, I think that we're going to see short term this transactional approach, say the EU, um, a group of MEPs recently, uh, they, 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 um, what, uh, sorry, um, talked about some particular I, I, practical ideas of what done in the short term to even sustain any sort of reform, especially for runners where we think that there is some <coughs> movement, you know, it's unclear as you sort of switch direction. Um, those were something like uh, a, a rush on a customs union that would deepen trade relations, improve custom controls, uh, popular that maybe help um, in political leaders regions get quick, such as eliminations of roaming charges or um, integration to the EU's ener emerging union or digital markets, trust funds focusing on economic infrastructure, supporting economic reforms, um, and, and other initiatives that will help sort of phase out monopolies, limiting the role of oligarchs, et cetera. Those types of ideas are, are helpful and might be something that could be useful in the short term while we do see the big, these big questions about membership, map, et cetera, it's not going to happen right, right now. But if roof can somehow be sustained in the term, at some point in the future when it could be um, a door of opportunity, it, you know, maybe 
if reforms continue, then there could be some positive in the future. So I think important to look at what can be done right now while talking about these really good questions sort of from a high level, where do we see things and, and, and what should be done. Thank you, Laura. Um, my role as moderator, uh, I feel I reserve the right to uh, ask the first couple questions. So I'm going to take advantage of that. Um, first question is for Laura. Uh, you, you mentioned that you, you see a transitional approach as being uh, something that is possible, um, at least for the short term, in lieu of kind of this ticket conditionality items like membership in NATO, membership in the EU. Um, and it, it Reminds me of um, past uh, the end of last year, ahead of partnerships in late November. Uh, the UN Parliament issued a, a for more tangible benchmarks and rewards um, by advanced uh, Europe, uh, Eastern partnership states, uh, including the possibility of flies in the face of this whole discussion we're having because that actually seems to, seems to imply that it is possible that it is open. I mean, how how real do you something like that is. And um, is it just a warm statement from Brussels, or is conditionality making a, a comeback? Um, I, I would, what I would argue and what I would, would say is that for leaders in the countries such as Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, um, spending time cultivating political and opinion leaders for, for, for individual members, pushing some of, um, for some of the um, declarations from the MPs resolution, uh, spending time in Germany, focusing less I think is going to be useful, and more, you know, putting forward security arguments such as a strong independent Georgia is good for the security of Europe, and it's a necessary long-term strategy for combating Russian aggression. For, I would also argue, you know, continuing to work on economic reform, that's also going to, um, help security, so pushing some of these economic initiatives um, that have been put forward. And then asking for particular things such as petitioning the EU for uh, an uh, anti-corrupt assistance with for Ukraine with anti-corruption reforms, independent anti-corruption uh, courts, or soft, soft um, things such as, you know, international scholarships or exchange programs. Those have been very, very beneficial and can continue to sort of move things forward. So I would say definitely pivot away from big tasks towards practical might be in the current environment. Uh, Link, um, do you think the West made a, a mistake conditioning integration or other offerings to reform? I mean, did this undercut the case for, for merits in the run um, by... by Conflating it as a, as a bargaining chip, um, or did they just, or did the West just make a fail to make a, a convincing, sustained case for organic reform, or both? <laughs> I, I don't think it. I'm okay with with using some carrots as a way to incentivize reform. I am the problem that you, in your question, in my view, seem to kind of dance around a little bit is that is that that, there's two ways to look at this, I guess. One, it would be to say that in many countries, the desire for reform was never as deep as we would have liked to have seen. And the other is that we, we were happy, we, we didn't push it when we thought we saw that desire real. real. And because of that, the danger remain that as as countries you know as those carrots become less realistic the desire for reform erodes on the other hand i'm not i'm not convinced it's a little sounds a little implicit right clearly ukraine to a great extent that's what happened right uh that that's one of the reasons that that contributed to the kind of the 2010 to 2013 events not the not the events since then um I'm exhausted. Um, so, so let me just back to it. Okay. Uh, a, a question. Yes, uh, no, no. The desire for reform, so how real it is. 
it's, it's interesting because in recent Ukrainian um, uh, protests, you saw a really strong engaged civil society, and the protests almost were because of the desire for reform that had not sort of been undertaken by government, um, by this like broad swath of really engaged civil society and others in the population who want to reduce from a really organic way. So, and, and, and that's why we're looking at the 2010 2014 yeah. time to okay. make this argument. The, the, the point I was going to make uh, related to this was that, you know. Countries, states negotiate with other states what they do if you're a poor state, if you're not a superpower. And the idea that Moldova or Georgia would look around and say, I can get, uh, I can get numbing charges from the EU and I get uh, some investment loans with low interest from China, like that's, that's, total, that's very rational behavior by the states in question. It's not evidence of a, of a desire to reform. It's evidence of a, of a desire to advance state interests. It doesn't preclude <coughs> a desire to reform, but I think we should read too much into it. Okay. Uh, so I'd like to open the, the questions. Please introduce yourself if you can. Uh, Stan, when we talk about democracy, we're talking about the same thing, but I don't think we are. If I may, I'd like to quote a couple sentences from Lincoln's first inaugural, which I think bears on this. A majority held in restraint by constitutional checks and limitations, and always changing easily with deliberate changes of popular opinions and sentiments, that's the key phrase, is the only true sovereign of a free people. Whoever rejects it does of necessity fly to anarchy or to despotism. This is a rejection of the nation state as a form of democracy. When he talks about public opinion, a few years earlier, John Stuart Mill, an unrepresentative government, had promoted the idea of the nation state. This had been really floating around with the French Revolution maybe before. Lincoln was rejecting that. You have to focus on public opinion, no identification of the nation with the state. In the United States, at the founding of the United States, we spoke of the empire of liberty, a large amount of it. I think this is the difference here. When people talk about democracy nowadays, they tend to think of the nation state. And they, you know, they don't think of the constitutional checks and limitations so much. It's majority rule. These, I think, are the critical matters. I think you have to go back into the history more of how this evolved before you can start in on these questions. Do, do you have a, a, a question? I, it's just a comment. Yeah, that's fine. I, I'm, I'm not sure I agree for a couple of reasons. I think that, that I've worked on democracy issues all over the world, not just in this region, um, and not just for American organizations. And Almost everyone understands that this is about limiting state power, that this is about checks and balances, <laughs> almost to a fault. Um, it may not end up that way, but everyone who talks about democracy gets that. So I'm a little hesitant to say um, that people don't talk to this. I think your point is, is an accurate one. But, and and I, I mean, I think there's a, there's a challenge here, which is that, that and I wrote this in uh, the Democracy Promotion Paradox, I think. In this town, and I mean literally in this town, Washington, a Democrat, if you're a leader of a foreign country, which I don't think any of us are, but if you are and you want to be a Democrat, you have to have two qualifications. You have to be under 50 years old, you have to speak English, full stop, right? And which means as of like a month and a half ago, I can no longer be a democratically elected leader of a foreign country. Um, but because what has happened is not that those who are thinking about what democracy is lack a sophisticated understanding of it. It's that everyone else, and I am including, I, I, I am, okay, I, I'm, um, I'm not from Washington. I rarely even spend the night here, and it's not because I'm an outsider like Sarah Palin. It's because I have children and a dog, and I like to get home. Um, but I am amazed at the people in high-ranking positions in this town, and I'm not, I'm not pointing partisan fingers because it's across partisan lines, very powerful people who thinks who is who are impressed when they meet a foreigner who speaks English. I'm sorry, but that is mind blowing. New York is a tougher town. It's a little harder. 
we're a little, we're more skeptical there. But that's your problem. That, aha, he speaks English. He went to school at Phil and X American, nothing wrong with American universities. I've taught a lot of them, you know. But that is not proof that you are a Democrat. That is the big, and the kind of hoodwinkery that goes on around that. And now, 25 years in, everyone knows that game. So I think that is actually a more, and, 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 and I would also, and I don't want to get a lecture about democracy, but I would also add, I think another problem is that we tend to project, there is much about American democracy that is unique in the context of other democratic states around the world. And we, because the United States is, and again, I don't know this new world of the United States, but, but you know, through the end of 2016, is the largest single actor in the democracy promotion of the world, that we tend to put an emphasis on local politics, right? A local a very strong argument in the democratic literature against having power at the local level, right? Scale it up, right? Americans, right? Uh, represent discrete geographical area, which is actually one of the problems of our democracy. It is all constituency service and parallel and carrying a, a thing back to my district rather than can I think broadly about what's best for the country, right? But we, we bring these back so it's so American democracy. So there are problems of understanding of democracy, but I'm not sure the one that you outlined is the one that I would give as, as the biggest. So, well, I think what I said about NATO, basically you maybe I said that. I, what I said about NATO was that I'm sorry, let me turn this on. What I said about NATO was that for many countries like Georgia, Moldova, Ukraine, the promise of NATO membership doesn't seem realistic in the near Um, <laughs> more people bought the baseball book, actually. But uh, in the democracy promotion paradox, this was before Trump and everything, but I said there's a very easy argument to the United States. I did not expect it to be picked up. I, I expect it to be picked up by the party that lost the election, not the... In public, and that's one of the reasons uh, we have some of the problems we have today. So I, I have a, a question. Um, responsive, responsive, good governance um, in the abstract, uh, which is predominantly conflated with liberal democracy, um, have clear benefits for a state's economic development and security. Uh, so why has it been such a challenge uh, to link <coughs> liberal democratic development with some of these concepts? And, and why has conditionality really been uh, the primary vehicle uh, for democracy rather than uh, these organic cases for reform? And this is for both of you guys. If, I, if I'm understanding the question right, and I think that there is a lot to say on economic development and reform for the we've been talking about is Moldova, Georgia, Ukraine, and I know it's written a lot on how economic development in Georgia can be um, a security strategy for them, and I think I think that's important. And, you know, maybe we can go into that. But um, goal, we have a global economy, and some of the, the question you know about reforms is on the nation level. So obviously, the the response or a non-responsive government can hinder economic development, but Economic trends are global, so the way that they're interacting, I think, it's not, it's, it's, it's complex, so it's not necessarily one follows, if, if I'm understanding the question. I don't know if you have something to add.
that seems like a very narrow. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I was a student, Sam. I, I, I can see that. <laughs> and, and, and I'm a, I'm a, I think if you read the entire oeuvre, I need to a sense of his uh, contribution. People focus on the later work and miss more important uh, contributions. That's enough. But this should be your the long answer is it never ends. Nothing is permanent, but also nothing ever does at the time, right? So, so if you are in somewhere in the middle of mountaintop in Georgia, 1915, you're saying to yourself, years from now, we'll be part of the Soviet Union, and all of this will happen, right? And if you are, I mean, I went to graduate school in the 90s. On things in the summer of 91, summer of 91, I went to grad school for the summer. We were doing Moscow presentations on why this would never, right? Distance in physical life in the unimagined. The, 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 argue this is a We, 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 we know that back we, when we think we know about that maybe bigger picture, but we have to remember that it, nothing looks at the moment. So, so this, five years from now, this might be a blip, and we have to open to the possibility. Sir? Months ago, I was the U.S. Customs and Border Protection attache to uh, the European And yet, and you sweet in what happened was privacy laws of your got in the way, and these back to World War II. But U.S. Systems a lot of information we protected. The Europeans don't collect information because mere collection of information is a violation of privacy. So, as I said, in this split between the U.S. and Europe on trade issues, security issues, and I'd like to give you what you think it does to uh, democratic um, uh, coalition and democracy in general. Someone told me when you don't know the question, you should know. I have not given that a thought. I feel like I could really give you a good answer. Well, your question, I also don't know how to answer it, but it does. It did another question, which I, I just um, um, this idea about incentives. And reform. Two questions. One, is, um, DCA all these uh, relations between the EU and countries on in Eastern Partnership. Uh, I've done a lot of work on the sport, border and control technical work. Um, and then the question was from the EU often: well, how, how do we sustain that form and make sure it keeps happening? But then the also for countries in the EU 
what about their reforms area? There's some there, there. I don't know the answer, um, but it is it is interesting discussing conditionality. Um, so yeah, I, I the answer. That's what got me thinking. <laughs> well, I, th I think there's another point there uh, is worth exploring, and please correct. Me. I'm doing this in a completely different uh, direction, but I think maybe a way of, of answering that question is asking these coalitions of democracy or what will the West? Um, is only a, a text of orientation when we talk about the issue of condition when we talk about uh, the possibility of integrating um, aspiring states uh, from Eastern Europe, Asia, uh, and beyond. There are just too much different opinion between and among this com the countries that this, this community uh, allow for conditionality to again. I mean, you mentioned that, um, in the short term, transnationality may be the key to moving things going, but are things ever going to come back? I and mean, this is something I'd like to hear from both of you if you can. You're two different questions. One is, is, is the West as it were fragment, or is what can they ever come back? Two, there you go. 